Start us off just by saying welcome. I'm Casey Morrow. I'm the director of the Vermont Learning Collaborative, which is the building we're in. Um, and we're thrilled you're all here. We are, we are uh, largely a provider of uh, professional development for educators, um, but it's been wonderful for us to include a lot of community groups at various times, and obviously the, the many conservation commissions that are uh, represented tonight uh, are part of that story. So again, thanks for being here. And uh, we'll turn the meeting right over to Mary Ellen. Here we go. Hi, I'm the, the next step in this process. <laughs> um, welcome to all of you from the, concert, the Area Conservation Commissions. Um, we've put, put this together. There is such grave concern about the invasive problem, and obviously um, having all of you here tonight. Um, so this is being sponsored by the Area Conservation Commissions, the um, Body Bail Environmental Education Center, and the Woodlot Owners Association. So everybody has come together uh, to make this happen, and our hope is to make more and more events like this happen. Um, I am Lynn Levine. I'm a member of the Dumberson Conservation Commission, and this has been an issue dear to my heart. <coughs> I am a forester, as many of you know, and I teach a lot of tracking. So I wanted to thank the Le Learning Collaborative, Collaborative for hosting this as many, many of our events. We have said that area um, conservation commissions have been with us, and that means, just to say again, Dumberston, Guilford, Brattleboro, Putney, Marlboro, Woodland Owners, and Bonnyvale. And uh, in particular, what I mentioned before is Guilford has done an incredible amount of work with invasive work, so I really want to point that out. Um, besides, I'll introduce Jeff, but I wanted to let you know that we have some other guests here who you'll be able to ask questions to. One of them is Kim Royer, if you just right back there, who's the Deputy Commissioner of Fish and Wildlife. And then we have Adam Murkowski, who's the uh, deer biologist, and he's actually waving his hand. Okay. Um, Brian Ames is the head of the Fish and Wildlife Board, and Back there, he's not even waving his hand. <laughs> all, right, all, right, all right, great. Um, so, you, I mean, it's amazing because here you can make a difference, and that's why you're all here to learn more and make a difference. This, this topic has been, I mean, today, all I did was walk through a harvested area full of <coughs> Japanese barberry and bittersweet, and I was overwhelmed. But then, all of a sudden, I looked up and surrounding me was tufted titmouse. It was a whole, a whole flock of them. And it said, that's why we're doing this, because wonderful things happen in the woods. So as we hear about this other part, I just want to remember why we're all here, because we love our land. So um, we're going to have, Jack is going to be I bet you're a little overwhelmed by this wonderful audience, yeah, right? Absolutely. Absolutely, okay. So Jeff is the chief scientist um, from the Connecticut Extension, and he's been doing that since 2005. Um, he's involved in many different research projects, which are very varied, and some of them involve storm control so that you can have resilient trees near um, uh, um, power lines, and some of them, another project is forests for the birds, um, promoting songbirds and so forth, and it's just all over the place. Rehabilitating high-graded stands that the tree, the stands that, you know, the good things haven't happened. We left the poor trees instead of the good trees, and it goes on and on. So there's lots of different topics that you're involved with, and so I'd like you to welcome Jeff. Let's, as Lynn said, I am a little overwhelmed by how many people are here. I really appreciate it. Uh, so, but with this big a group, I think we're going to have to wait and hold uh, any questions till the end uh, so we can get out of here before midnight. Uh, where, oh, I would like to acknowledge at the very beginning is Scott Williams, uh, who is uh, the wildlife uh, biologist in my department. Because uh, Scott and I have worked hand in glove. I'm more of the forester, forest ecologist, and Scott handles uh, the ticks and the deer, literally. Just a, a quick background, just a little bit of pride here. The Connect, I work for the Kinetic Agricultural Experiment Station, 
And we are the first experiment station in the entire country. So now every state has one. Just a little pride. And we do a, a lot of wildlife uh, research. Uh, just to let you know, and some of this is going to come in the bear, but you know, looking at deer vehicle collisions, looking at forest regeneration, we're going to touch a little on that, looking at seed dispersal, I think you're going to be really surprised by that. Yeah. Then this last one, we're looking at barberry mice and ticks. And you know why that buck was so darn proud? He was in a water company area where there's no hunting, so he could drive right by him. <laughs> <laughs> and one day he posed for us. <laughs> So just a quick overview of what we're going to do. We're going to talk about uh, a little bit about my disease, uh, a little bit about the impact of large deer herds, the impact of invasive species. And I think there'll be some surprises there. And then start looking at the interaction of invasive species and deer on, on tick-borne diseases, their interaction on forest ecosystems out there just in general. And then just really briefly touch on control of invasive species. because. Each one of these things could take 45 minutes to talk. Now, because it's a bigger group than I thought, not everybody's going to be able to read this, but I happen to be a fan of Get Fuzzy. It's very sarcastic. It goes, welcome to the previews for the new horror movies. Be ready to scream. And it goes, Napwork Film presents, it came from Connecticut. <laughs> How scary is that? It says, the face of evil. It goes, I don't see anything there. That's why it's scary. It's Deer Tick, the movie. <laughs> so yes, Lyme disease was actually named after uh, Lyme, Connecticut, was, where it's first discovered. What's kind of ironic is when they first uh, found it, they didn't realize that that property was completely surrounded by barbary and had high deer populations. But I wanted to look up something little local for here, and I gotta tell you, I was shocked when I found this this morning. This is from the Burlington Free Press last year. Vermont has the second highest rate of Lyme disease in the entire country. And most of it is down here in the southern part of the state. You know, there's, there's not a whole lot uh, up in the Northeast Kingdom. So you guys are in one of the real hot spots in the entire country, which means the entire world for Lyme disease. <laughs> And what's interesting, if you look at arthropod, which is a nice way of saying insects and spiders and stuff, uh, diseases in the United States, Lyme disease accounts for about 75% of all diseases we have that are spread by, by bugs and stuff. And this is just a, a quick map showing the different ones. <clears throat> Anaplasmosis, there's just a little bit getting up here into Vermont, but you get into uh, you know, the, the flatlands of southern New England, there's a lot. There's actually babesiosis is just coming in, and that's a, a pretty devastating one. Luckily, we don't have a lot of aureliosis <coughs> yet, but look at Lyme disease. Whew. Big area there and a big area over uh, in the Wisconsin area. And we occasionally have a little bit of Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Luckily, we don't have uh, two malaria. The scary thing, uh, one of these is, where is it here? Rocky Mountain spotted fever spread by the Lone Star tick, which is in southern New England. So I don't know if anybody here ever goes to the Cape. If you get bit by this, there's a certain percentage of the population that once you're bit by it, you become allergic to mammalian meat. And you can't eat anything, meat out of mammals, or else you just break out in hives, which is a scary thing. And Lyme disease has been increasing over the years. Uh, it's probably been going up faster, but they're actually, most physicians don't even, re they're supposed to report it, but they don't. I know I go to my doctor about every fall, and he goes, Jeff, have you been bitten by tick? And I go, yes, sir. And he goes, here's your doxycycline. Don't drink for two weeks and stay out of the sun. <laughs> um, because, you know, we tend to get stiff muscles and everything else, so that's just the way it is. <clears throat> what you might be surprised at is when do you see ticks? When do you expect to see ticks? Spring, spring and fall. Spring and fall. Spring and fall. Mm -hmm. You know when most people get Lyme disease? They get it in the summer. Because ticks actually have a two year life cycle, which is pretty, I think it's kind of cool. They hatch out as eggs in the spring, and in the summer they have larvae, which if you want to see them, they're really small. You've got to collect mice or chipmunks. And basically, you look at their ears is where there's a lot of them. You can see them when they're engorged. But then they fall off, and they wait all the way until the following spring when the nymphs come out. And the nymphs are the ones, and I'll show you in a second why. That's where most people pick it up. 
and then they feed and they drop off and then you have the adults and those are the ones you see in the fall those are the ones that are coming out right now they're pretty easy to see this is just again saying we get most of it in the summer. most of the cases are in the summer to so reinforce it here's the reason why we get most of the cases in the summer when the eggs hatch and the larvae are feeding they don't have Lyme disease they don't have <coughs> technically speaking oh, let's not get too technical uh, the, the ticks don't have the, the bacteria, which is the causal agent of Lyme disease. That's how you're supposed to say it. I'm going to say that they don't have Lyme disease, make it easy. But when, if they bite, and especially a small rodent, a chipmunk or a mouse, which is carrying the bacterium, then they pick it up and then they can transmit it to us. So here's what you have to look for in the summer. <laughs> That's why most people don't, never even realize that they've been bitten and they come down with Lyme disease. You know, there's, there's a blow up of one on a fingernail. I happen to be lucky that I'm allergic to ticks, so I can feel them about two hours after they start to bite and can find them. But even so, uh, occasionally you get one that bites you and you don't know it. And that's why I got a bullseye rash in the center of my back and my wife thought I was gonna have a spinal problem. Um, like I said, that's just incredibly, that's what you're looking for. The good news is, if you do find you have a tick on you, you have, at 24 hours after they start to bite into you, there's been zero transmission of the Lyme disease fire key. You get out in 24 hours, you're not gonna get it. Even at 48 hours, only 12% of the ticks have actually transmitted the spiro key. So the real key is, if you're out in the woods and if you're not spraying your clothes, but even if you do, is stand in front of a full-length mirror every night and inspect yourself. We're in every mole in your body. And the rash can look like absolutely anything. You know, they, they talk about with Lyme disease, you expect to see a target-shaped rash. It doesn't always look like that. Sometimes it looks like a bruise. Sometimes it just looks like a strawberry on your leg. I'm gonna stop here a minute. If some people wanna write this down, you can actually look this stuff up on the web. There's a tick management handbook that we put out. And there's also Tick-Borne Disease in the United States, which is put out by the CDC. <coughs> Those are both really great references. And you can find them online, and if you really wheel and deal, you can probably get a hard copy. <coughs> so we're gonna be talking about ticks and deer, so let's go back into deer. We're gonna be doing a little bouncing around here first. Does deer have some real impacts on, on native forest native ecosystem. One is what do deer do? They go out there and they eat a lot, right? That increases available growing spaces. Just by eating all the vegetation out there, they leave growing space for new plants. But one of the things they do is they love eating flowers. And they love when they eat the leaves, there's fewer flowers and fewer seeds. So they lower the reproductive output. They lower the number of seeds that are produced by our wildflowers and by our native shrubs. And what happens when they reduce the number of seeds? Well, plants aren't immortal. Uh, you know, well, trilliums are an exception. Trilliums can actually live for 60 years, but a lot of our wildflowers will live for five, 10 years. So you've got to have new plants established to keep them. And if the deer are constantly mowing them down, they don't have the reserves to get through the tough years. They don't have the energy to produce seeds. So we're going to lose those plants. One of the interesting things we found, and as I said, I get to put out bizarre facts here tonight, is deer can disperse alien species long distance. Aliens are, if you want to think about them, invasive species. Oops. Skip over that. <laughs> deer here one right now. I guess I'm going to get to the alien species in a second. I mixed it up with this morning. Here's the scary thing. This is what happens when you have 60 deer per square mile. That's a sugar maple stand in about the third week in May. And everything you see green out there is barberry. This is actually a year after we mowed it down. You should be seeing wildflowers out there. You should be able to see shrubs. I mean, if you want a rifle hunt, this is a great place because you can shoot 200 yards through the woods and see something. But a woods should never look like this. And maybe if you're lucky, like in Pennsylvania, at least you have something green on the ground, but it's nothing but hay scented fern. <laughs> and that can be another problem when you have too many, they eat all the shrubs, so you've got this fernery. Aesthetically, it's kind of pretty, especially on a foggy day. 
But I think what a lot of us like to see when we go out there in the spring, I mean, my wife and I and our kids and my grandkids get a little bit older, go out there, is to look at the spring wildflowers. You know, the first blood roots that are coming up and the Herb Roberts and in summer, you know, looking for the lady slippers. I don't know if you guys have fringe polygay up here. Oh, do you? That is so pretty. It's too bad it wasn't big. And my favorite native wildflower, if any, how many people here have ever seen fringe gentian? Oh, you should find a person next to you that's seen it and go out and see it. They're actually this big and they're metallic. They're the neatest things when they start flowering in this <coughs> Don't they flower in the fall? Huh? Don't they flower in the fall? Well, around us, they flower mid September through uh, about another week. And then, the, you know, the bottle gentians flowered a month ago. But these are flowering right now. And the other thing why having all those native wildflowers out there is what's one of the things that's been in the news lately? Bees. Bees. But it's also, there's, there's a real issue with native pollinators out there. And if you've got this carpet of, of no wildflowers, so just leaves, a carpet of leaves, or if you've got just a monoculture of one invasive species, it might flower for a week or two. So the bees would do great for a week or two, but then what happens during the rest of the year? One of the things we want is we want to have wildflowers that are flowering throughout the year to help maintain our native uh, pollinators out there. So I guess that makes the slides up a little bit. Remember I said before that deer spread invasive species? So as a scientist, we get to do some pretty strange things. <laughs> and we read about this study where, uh, I think it was Mark's first name, but Velen over in New York <coughs> collected some deer pellet samples and found out that they had viable honeysuckle seeds in them. And, you know, honeysuckle can be a, a real problem with invasives. So, like I said, being scientists, we we're uh, a little bit strange. We went out and collected 566 pellet groups, put them in the fridge for two months, because a lot of seeds, you know, they need that cold treatment to germinate. And we planted them. And lo and behold, we had some seedlings coming out of them. Not just a few. 11,512 germinates we pulled out of those samples. 86 unique taxes. So basically, 86, at least 86 species were growing out of those deer pellets. And here comes the first dance. So hopefully, you'll always remember that deer spread alien invasive species. 40% of the species we found were not native to the United States. 70% of the seedlings were a species that weren't native to the United States. So the majority of the seeds that the deer were eating that it ripened, went right through the deer system, and then deer deposited them across the landscape. And we would find these pellet groups, you know, a half mile in the woods. And one of the scary things we found out there was Japanese still grass. I'll have more to say about this at the end. But we found autumn olive, uh, multiflora rose, uh, wineberry. I don't know if that's up here yet and honeysuckle. We also found petunias, watermelons, uh, green pepper. Actually, in my garden is a very tasty one. But one of the reasons why we're here tonight, too, so deer are spreading invasive species. Why should you care about invasive species? I mean, they are a plant out there, and they're green, right? So why do you care? Uh, you know what? Can I go back? No, not this way. You know, this is a brand new computer, so if I hit the wrong button, yeah. uh, I might even take a chance at doing it. One of the things we found, and other people reported, areas where you've got invasive species, you can have twice the earthworm density. And I imagine a number of you out here are aware that we didn't have earthworms here after glaciation, right? Mm -hmm. So our forests and our plants that are here are used to growing without earthworms. And we like having some earthworms out in the forest, that's fine. Well, what happens is when you start doubling the number, almost doubling the number of, of earthworms, earthworm biomass out there, it has some real negative consequences to the forest. And these aren't even areas that have those Russian wigglers. Do you guys have those here yet? The ones of the crazy worms? No. Oh, yours. Yeah. You can make, try not to get crazy worms. We've actually had them start to get into Connecticut where fishermen have. By the end of summer, the ground is absolutely bare. 
If you grab the back end of them, they drop their tail off and they, they wiggle away. You can have like 50 worms in an area this big on <coughs> slow surface. They are really scary. But even with the ones we have, you get a lot of earthworms by August. All you've got are worm, ca worm castings if you go on into a barberry stand. If you go into a rose stand, you'll just see nothing but earthworm cast. You don't see that protective layer of leaf litter. And think about what's that leaf litter do? It protects that soil when we get a heavy rainfall. It also acts like a protective blanket. It's also sort of the seedbed for all of our native wildflowers. That's what they're used to. So we have nothing but earthworm cast, which are great in the vegetable garden. I love them in my vegetable garden. But then we start getting sheet erosion. These are pictures from unmanaged forests. You should never see sheet erosion, especially with the heavy slopes of Connecticut, right? <laughs> Oh, come on. <laughs> you guys have real mountains here. Sheet erosion, are you saying? Sheet. Sheet erosion, so it's sort of like a sheet of stuff coming off. And the one thing you should certainly never see, again, in the Connecticut mountains, are gully formations in unmanaged forest. When you've got gully formations with a couple percent slope, that tells you you've got a real health issue out there. And we've seen this uh, in several places in Connecticut. Like I said, not just losing the leaf litter, not just sheet erosion, but gully formation and unmanaged forest. That's totally unnatural. And why do we worry about this, just beside the fact we don't like gullies? Well, what's a real big issue right now? It's riparian uh, health, isn't it? Mm -hmm. In all of our rivers. Mm -hmm. If we start having sheet erosion, if we start having gully formations, we're going to have sediments washing into our rivers. And those sediments are also going to be carrying phosphorus, which earthworms make more available, and they're going to be carrying nitrates. So that, that can be a real issue for riparian health. You never think about barberry affecting worms, then affecting riparian health, and then affecting all the fish. It's a complicated world. It's kind of fun. And what we'll talk a little bit about more is invasive species, where a lot of our work done is increase the Lyme disease risk. Just to show you again, in areas, oh, I don't think I've shown this one, in areas where barberry has been uh, labeled invasive by the states or where there's a real pockets of Lyme disease. And it's not just uh, our work, uh, but some other ones. There's actually a great study by the folks up at the Maine Medical Institute uh, who looked at um, the uh, number of ticks up in, in southern Maine and found that areas which had increased exotic invasives, you know, non-native species, they had increased number of black-legged ticks that were carrying Lyme disease. And out in Missouri, they found out where they had a lot of honeysuckle, they found an increased risk of auriculosis. There's actually been a couple other studies that have come out now, too. Put them all on the slide. And here's where it's scary in Connecticut. If we go into a typical forest, without invasive species, you're going to have 10 ticks per acre which are carrying Lyme disease. They actually have, you know, the spirochetes calls it agent Lyme disease. So every dancing tick is 10 ticks per acre. Mm -hmm. If we go into a stand with a lot of barberry, I should say Scott's six foot eight, so you can see how tall the barberry is there. We don't have 10 ticks per acre. We don't have 50 ticks per acre. We don't have 100 ticks per acre. We've got almost 130 ticks per acre out there. So which woods would you rather go into? But we find out if we go out there and if we control the invasive species, you can either, in big areas like we did two 20-acre blocks we were spraying, in smaller areas you can get out there. It's not quite as nice as Gary's uh, setup, uh, but we're using backpack flamethrowers. And if you control the barberry, you can drop it from 130 down to 40 in two years. Remember, they have a two-year life cycle, so it's going to take a while longer for it to drop. So by controlling uh, the, the invasive species out there, we've reduced the risk of Lyme disease by 40 to 60 percent, depending upon where we're at. That can have a real issue. I imagine if you're here, you love walking in the woods, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. And so that means if you're walking out in the woods, has anyone here not had a tick on them? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so would you rather walk, I mean, one of the things we want to do by controlling invasive species is make it safe for us to walk out there, make it safe for, you know, children to walk out there, 
make it safe for our pets. You know, dogs can get Lyme disease too. And there's always somebody in the audience who doesn't like the dancing ticks. So there's just a grab. If you had to walk through the woods, which one are you more likely to pick up a tick carrying Lyme disease? Which is also another reason to really check yourself. Don't be afraid to go in the woods. Just check yourself or spray your clothes. <clears throat> so why are there more ticks in areas with barberry with invasive species? Well, at first we thought it was mice. Because remember I showed you that graph that ticks at the beginning of life cycle have to feed on mice or chipmunks or small rodents? Mm -hmm. Well, we went out there, not to show you too many areas. We found there were the same number of mice in areas with invasives as without. It was a real surprise for us. So we went out there and actually measured temperature and humidity in areas with, uh, you know, dense barberry where it was still up. Actually areas where we had just sprayed the barberry so we still had the stems but the plants were dead so we still had the same physical structure. And then we went into adjacent woods that just had native plants. And lo and behold we found out, and I'll explain why in a second, it was the humidity, it wasn't the mice, it was the humidity levels caused by having these invasive species out there. Mm -hmm. So one of the few graphs I'm going to have here tonight is just explain it. This is just time of day, there's 12 noon, and here's relative humidity. Put that line in there. The interesting thing is that at 80% relative humidity, ticks will desiccate and die. They really need a humid micro environment, mm -hmm. which is, is kind of amazing. 80% humidity is kind of high. But if you're on a plant stem, because plants are always transpiring, or if you're near a leaf, there's a lot of humidity there. So there's like a little bubble of humidity that, you know, the micro people that like studying all those boundary layers and that. <clears throat> well, when you look at areas where there's dense barberry, there's less than an hour. Every day, when the relative humidity up where the ticks are looking for a blood meal, that's called questing. There's less than an hour a day when that relative humidity is less than 80%. And they would have to, to quit looking for a meal. But in an area like a, a forest with native stuff where there's no barberry, it goes anywhere from 11 o'clock to 6 o'clock at night. It's too dry for ticks to look for a meal. They've got to drop down into the leaf litter. So these barberry, you know, the invasive species makes it a really nice place for ticks to look for, for blood meals. So if they have longer time to look for a, for a meal, they're more likely to find one, and they're more likely to survive and reproduce. So that's just all part of the deer, alien species, Lyme disease triangle. Mm -hmm. I'm scared. We all love triangles. <laughs> and so this is some, you know, one of the things you know you could talk about is is how can we reduce you know Lyme disease? And one of the things you could possibly go after is what they're calling host target. I got these from Kirby Safford, who's our, our big tick guy. One thing is, is, is look at the host. You know, the, the deer and the white-footed mice and small chipmunks. So one of the things they did is they actually fenced in a couple of neighborhoods down in, um, in Lyme, Connecticut. And I got these from Kirby, so he, he likes this is for a science talk. But basically, within 70 yards, ignore the meters, just put in the yards. Within 70, once you're 70 yards away from a fence, there's a 100% reduction in larvae. And even for the nips, the ones, remember I said the bite us in midsummer, they're hard to see, they usually give us Lyme disease, 84% reduction, just by keeping the deer out of a property. Okay, let's face it, we can't surround the town of Dummerston with a fence, right, and get rid of every deer inside. And if most of us don't have, you know, 70 yards is 200 feet. So we don't have, you know, 200 feet from our house in every direction we're going to put a fence up. And that would only be for the house. You couldn't even have the yard. Mm -hmm. It would be expensive, and every storm you'd have to repair your fence. <clears throat> so, so people have looked at reducing uh, the impact of re doing uh, deer hunts. And this was Bluff Point down in southern Connecticut where I can't remember. I'll come here in a second. Oh, they had the deer density was 45 deer per square kilometer, which, hey, correct me, that's like 70 deer per square mile? Yes. Yeah? Yeah, it's so like 70 deer per square mile. So they went in there and they had a controlled hunt. After the first two years of having protests down there, that's why they're doing it, they were able to, to drop the deer numbers 
down to about five deer per kilometer, which I think is about eight deer per square mile. So the deer density is a dashed line, and this is going over time from 96 to 2007. What's really interesting is look what happened to Lyme disease. Lyme disease uh, actually went from an average of about uh, 20 people per 100 households, right? Yeah, about uh, 20 uh, households out of 100 had, somebody had a Lyme disease, down to about three or four. So by reducing the deer density down to less than 10 deer per square mile, you can reduce the number of Lyme diseases, but you're not going to eliminate it. There's actually another study they did up in uh, Maine. They looked at an island where they basically uh, <coughs> killed all the deer on the island. And once they took care, killed all the deer in the island, the tick population collapsed. <coughs> People don't get Lyme disease. But that's, again, that's not a practical thing. And i got to tell you, even though I'm a pretty avid gardener, and even though last week I saw two does and a fawn walking down my row of hostas, chewing them all down, <laughs> uh, I still want to see deer out there occasionally. Although, when they eat my Swiss chard, I get upset. <laughs> so, we're actually doing a study right now down in Redding, Connecticut, uh, where they're looking at reducing deer densities down on square mile blocks within areas, uh, down to less than 10 deer per square mile. In combination with uh, treating uh, the surrounding area with a fungus now they have, which they can spray and kill just ticks, doesn't kill spiders or anything else, to try to see if they can eliminate Lyme disease within an area, with a long-term goal of maybe expanding this out. I'm just looking back there because I'm looking at the wildlife people thinking, I don't think I told you guys a story, that when they started doing this, they had the hunters in town were upset because they had, I think it was 60 deer per square mile, so they could basically just go out and half an hour shoot a deer and walk back. <laughs> so the hunters were going out wearing full body armor and shooting blank guns next to where they were trying to shoot the deer. Okay, but, the, the, but, but there's more to this, this triangle than you'd think. Or there's another triangle. There's deer, alien species, and native plants. And as a forester and, you know, as a forest ecologist, this is what I'm really interested in. And here's the interesting. We planted some white pine in a field. We were actually doing a deer broth study, so this one really shows it. That's an 11-year-old white pine growing in an open field. Now, should 11-year-old white pines be this big? <laughs> oh, yeah, easily, you know, in full sun. Uh, so deer can have a real impact. And let's face it, deer can be cute and cuddly. That is not a Photoshop picture. That was actually a uh, hand-raised deer. Huh? No, that's Scott and I look the same, except, except Scott is uh, six foot eight, and because he used to row crew, uh, he's big, and he still has hair on the top of his head. Too many deer can be a problem. Once again, you know, I'm showing you a couple of these pictures. A forest should never look like this. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a scary thing. So we did a little study, just take a break from data. We had fun, got a big crew together, put a fence out in the woods. We found, you can always find old mailboxes and stuff in the sign. So we, we put up a mailbox and a, a light post just to tell the deer, you know, they could leave a message but not come <laughs> And, you know, you put a fence up, you have to do repairs. And this is six months after putting up a fence on one of our properties. Look at the inside and outside. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this when I talk about the effects of, of deer and vegetation. This is just several months later on the impact. Okay, what you guys are seeing is hot off the presses. We just did the analysis within the last month. So you're going to have to look at a couple graphs. I'll try to explain them because I don't have... Like neat picture explanations. If we look in the bottom here, ignore the says stems per hectare. Just look at the, the the general size of the bar, which is really important. And tall regeneration here, 1.5 meters, that's five feet high. So once things are five feet high, they're starting to get past where deer can eat them. You know, we actually like six or seven, but we're doing it there. Over here we have places that are inside fences. Now all these graphs can look the same. So this is inside a fence. And these are outside the fence. So deer can eat these guys, and they can't eat these guys. Okay, one more thing to complicate it, and I'll explain it. We have areas we call no barb, 
those are areas where we completely mowed down all the barberry. We went back and two or three times we hit it with backpack flamethrowers because we didn't want to mix herbicide into it and killed every invasive species. Areas with partial are areas where we went out and we just mowed everything down. We actually uh, used a fecon. For those of you who are outside, we sort of had what Gary had, except we had one in front of a skid steer, which is a lot of fun to drive in the woods. And then we had areas of dense barberry. There's barberry like this high that we didn't treat. Here's the interesting thing. To get tall forest regeneration, you needed to both control the barberry and it had to be inside the fence where the deer couldn't eat it. So it wasn't just if you control the barberry and outside the fence, that didn't work. You had to do both of them to really get uh, tall regeneration back. Like you said, after this, just one more scary graph. <laughs> and it's too bad the colors here aren't the same as they're showing on the screen. But you're going to get the general idea. So again, we have inside the fence and outside the fence. The one thing I hope that, that just pops out at you, ignore all this, we're actually looking at the volume of all the plants, is notice how these are mostly blues and grays. And these are supposed to be orange and yellow. But notice how the, here it's dominated by you know, the slate and the blue. And here it's dominated by the orange and the sort of yellow. Well, that's outside fence and inside fence. So we're seeing two things here. The other thing here, see how it goes from big down to small, big down to small? <clears throat> well, big down to small is going from areas where we completely control the barberry to areas where there's dense barberry. So the more you control the barberry, the more volume you have of herbaceous plants, you know, wildflowers, grasses, and ferns. What's kind of interesting, though, so we have that effect. So we get a lot more herbaceous stuff coming in. Where we have inside the fence where the deer couldn't eat anything, it was mostly short and tall perennials. What we think of wildflowers, those I showed you earlier, are things like asters or goldenrods or, um, <clears throat> I know most of them by the, the Latin, so I don't know their common names. We had just a little bit of grasses and ferns, the orange and yellows. Outside the fence, most of it were grasses and ferns, and there were very few wildflowers. So we saw this real interaction of deer and invasive species, where we had both, like, let's look here. This is outside the fence in a dense barberry. We had some ferns, and we had, you know, some tall perennials where they occasionally grew up there, but we didn't have very many, you know, wildflowers. We didn't have very many herbaceous plants. When we took care of the invasives, we had a lot of volume of herbaceous plants. So, you know, a much more diverse ecosystem out there. It's actually it's like this neat green carpet. But where the deer were, like I said, it was mostly grasses and ferns. When you want to see the wildflowers, that's when we were areas where we kept out the deer. Which I just thought was kind of neat. So just by how you manipulate it, invasives and deer, you can actually change the composition of all these herbaceous plants. And this is sort of the same thing. It shows that where we completely killed the barberry and where we kept the deer out, we had a lot more vines out there. But that wasn't necessarily a good thing. Can you see what the gray is? The gray are alien vines, non-native species. And this is a surprise for us. We went and we started reading around and found other folks who found this too. Deer love to eat Japanese honeysuckle, that's the vine honeysuckle, and they, they love to eat bittersweet. If you have zero deer out there, bittersweet goes absolutely nuts, and so does Japanese honeysuckle. Unfortunately, we didn't have a, a way of just saying, well, we only want 10 deer per square mile out here. I don't know how we'd do that. But you, you definitely want some deer out there. One thing I don't want to take home message people to say is, we should shoot every deer in the state. I mean, we want to have some deer out there. It's just a matter of keeping the population where they're sort of in balance. So the bottom line here is invasive shrub control. What that does is it opens up growing space. Because, you know, you get a barberry plant or a rose plant or a buckthorn, which is, you know, this big around or something. You can't have any wildflowers growing there, can you? You can't have any tree seedlings growing there. So you've got to control the invasives to provide that growing space. 
And then you need to have browse control but not deer elimination to allow the native species to grow up. So just another way with my silly uh, deer and aliens, they both work together and sort of eliminate regeneration. Now some people here tonight have, have talked a little bit about you know their stories about where they've got invasive species. And I gotta tell you, I don't think anyone here can top this. This is Charles Island off of Connecticut. It had 17 deer on 16 acres. That's 750 deer per square mile. So, how many acres do you have for your property? 80. 80, you would have 80 deer on your property. Can you imagine what it would look like? <laughs> you would have the forest of the future. This actually is an important breeding area for uh, snow egrets, lesser egrets, and night crown herons, or whatever it is. We found there was like, like I said, 16 acres, there's about three acres of Norway maple on the south end of the island. We found, I think, two red maples, a couple of black cherry, and a sassafras. The rest of the island was all Atlantis, Korea heaven. Every tree was infested with either Japanese honeysuckle or bittersweet. I said deer like to eat them, but once they get up a stem, they grow up and they grow up. The understory was all barberry and honeysuckle. That is truly the scariest place I've ever been in my life. <laughs> so, so what can you do? Like you said, there's a case where the deer and the basis have just got out of control. Well, this is Reader's Digest about 10 years ago. And I'm not going to wade into whatever controversy is going here on, on, on deer. That's certainly a political thing. <coughs> but there are a lot of people, including at least one of my daughters, who think deer are too cute to ever to kill. She's right. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, a very, it's, a, it's a real emotional subject, I'm a, like I said. We really, I mean, from a cost benefit, really, what you need to do is just, you know, you need to have hunting in an area where there are too many deer. And, you know, talking with the, the state wildlife people, it sounds like in a lot of the state, you guys actually have it under control. Uh, compared to what we have down south, it's, our deer herds are just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. So just real quick, I, I have to because they all, all the people gave us money to look at invasive species. It's pretty nice, but it didn't add up to as much as it looks. <laughs> But if somebody, well, if somebody gets a couple hundred dollars, we'll put the name up there. And I, I also want to credit everybody else who worked on this. Pete Smolich over at Cornell, we've worked with him. Scott Williams, the guy who looks like me, but big and handsome. Tom Wortley over at UConn, who looks like me, except he's gray. Um, uh, my technician, J.P. Parsky, and uh, Mike Short, who's another technician. They're great folks. And when I, I tell you a little bit about this control thing and what I passed out to, uh, I think I gave it to all the conser yeah. conservation commissions should have two copies, yeah. except for the folks down in in Brattleboro. Is anybody here from Brattleboro Conservation Commission? I got two copies for, for the Brattleboro Conservation Commission, too. When we talk about our things we did, we actually had in 28 study areas, uh, 149 plots, and we've created 122 acres. So we're not doing little two by two meter areas where we're creating. And we've looked at 56 treatment combinations uh, over the years. So this is sort of my opinion on, on what happens or what you might want to consider. If you've got a large infestation, and this is actually where we worked at, we ended up controlling two 20-acre blocks. They have 100 acres of Japanese barberry, which goes from this height, which it's on a hill, so it doesn't look like much. But you know, it's like mid-thigh up to six-foot-high barberry. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's impractical to go out there and try to do that um, yeah. mechanically. It's just too big. And as much as Gary would love to have the contract to go out there and treat 100 acres, that's just overwhelming. Um, what you can do for, for smaller ones, like what a land trust could do on their own property, is sort of do a two-step procedure. You know, if you've got a small one that you guys, you know, you think you can handle. You start with a healthy plant. And this is not only for barberry, but this would be for rose. And the first thing is, is kill the above ground stem. Mm -hmm. Ideally, you'd want to do it like two days after the leaves were fully expanded in the spring. Mm -hmm. 
let's face it, we can't time it to do it exactly at that time. So cut it down whenever you get a chance. My guys, and actually myself, we love doing this in the winter. It's not the <coughs> ideal time, but in the winter, you're wearing full Carhartt bibs and you're wearing heavy gloves. And especially when you're working with anything with thorns, the more protection you have, the better you feel. So mow it down. And what happens when you cut down almost anything? It re-sprouts, right? But when it re-sprouts, it really uses up its root reserves. All the starch reserves that are in the roots, it has to use those reserves to be able to grow the new top. That weakens the plant. And it also makes it a lot easier when you decide to kill it. And I'll show you a couple different ways of doing it. But for example, with, with garden, <coughs> we would start in some places with a plant which is six foot across and six foot high. You mow it down, and by the end of summer, when we come back to do the follow-up treatment, it'd be like a foot high and a foot across. So rather than treating this great big plant, going out there and hitting everything, we'd be treating this small plant. The other advantage of treating a small plant is if you're going to use a flamethrower or if you're going to apply herbicide, now you're applying it in a small area and you're not going to hit what technically are called non-target species. But what that means is you're not going to be spraying the tree regeneration, you're not going to be spraying the wildflowers. I don't care if it's with flame or with herbicide. So you're going to have a lighter footprint on the land. Hello. So the first step, there's a lot of different options. You can use a brush saw. If anyone wants to use a brush saw, you know what, I didn't have a picture of laying around this. You don't want to use a saw blade. One thing, you can't use a weed whacker. You got to get a brush saw with the shoulder straps. It's like a, a, we use steel 450s and 550s, they're big machines. And you don't want to have a saw blade on it when you're cutting down stuff less than half an inch in diameter. Get what we call the ninja blade. They sell it. It's like a three point, a, it's a, a blade with uh, three blades coming out, sort of like a ninja throwing star. Uh, one, it cuts so much faster, you never have to sharpen it. And I don't know if anyone here has ever tried to, to refile a, a brush saw blade. Has anyone here ever done that? It is pretty darn tough to get it done right. It takes a lot of time. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, I got one of your truck. I'll bring it in there. You got the ninja blade? Yeah. Yeah, let me tell you, isn't that a great... You can oh, sharpen a ninja blade too. Huh? It's easier to sharpen and you can flip it upside down and you have a fresh set of, of blades right there for you. I just love it. I would not recommend, we, we tried uh, a DR mower, like a walk behind mower. Those are probably great in the commercials where they're mowing down these nice flat fields that are full of uh, like goldenrod. Try muscling one of those things through the woods where you're banging in the trees. Every time you come in in front of a, uh, a down stem that's like four inches in diameter, you gotta try to walk and cradle it over. And if there's any rocks around, I don't know if there's any rocks in the soil. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, like you said, that's great for, for fields. Uh, we actually use them on our farms down in the fields. In the woods, I would never recommend it. Uh, I don't have a picture of Gary's setup. Maybe he'll send me one. Uh, but we actually use the, the skid steer. But what I think the skid steers are cooler than the tractor is we could do 360s and 720s on the snow. <laughs> uh, something that actually could be cost effective for like a state agency or we could do it is using prescribed fire. Uh, it's just as effective as killing the top. <laughs> and propane torches, which I wouldn't recommend as the first step. Why does this not want to work anymore? Use it this well, I'm using a different button. It went backwards. Oh, it went backwards. There we go. And for the second step, you can come out there and use, you know, directed heating. Uh, you can use glyphosate or tripiclear. Glyphosate is the active ingredient in Roundup. And I know I'm not going to get into controversy about Roundup and Monsanto. And tripiclear is the active ingredient in Garland. There's both uh, generic versions available. They all work. <coughs> Well, I think the propane torches are really useful, and, and here I'm talking, like I said, for land trust where you're, you're trying to do an acre and you guys can handle it on your own. I think they're really useful for wetland or riparian areas, you know, riverside areas, wet areas, because you don't have that fire risk. One of the things, if you were out there listening to Gary's, they said a lot of times they have to shut down at 10, 11 o'clock. 
they don't put the woods on fire. <clears throat> well, I'll tell you, one day uh, we were using it, and there had been a thunderstorm the night before. We got an inch and a half of rain. But we hadn't had rain for, I don't know, two, three, four weeks beforehand. So we weren't thinking. We went out there, and we're hitting the barber, and all of a sudden we noticed, yeah, we had an inch of rain, but the bottom of every log that was rotting was dry punk and was on fire. So we spent two hours chasing smokers up there. And if anyone here has ever worked a fire in the woods chasing smokers, it really is not fun. It's, I think it's good for small patches and park. And like I said, if, if you want to use it, you want to volunteer your labor pool because it takes a lot of time if you're doing it on your own. Although it is a lot of fun. I have one for my own yard. <laughs> you want to make sure the leaf litter is damp. My boss actually, what he said literally is, Jeff, you got permission to do this. If you put the woods on fire and anybody's hurt or house burns down, you're fired. <laughs> That's what he told me. So we still went ahead and did it, but he just wanted to make darn certain that I was being careful. And he was serious. He would have fired me. I think you should consider herbicide when clumps are larger than four feet high. That usually means that they're growing in a lot of sun. So they're going to be able to, even when you cut them down, they're going to want to re-sprout again, unless you can dig up the roots. Uh, I think when you've got multiple invasives there, it, it can be kind of tough uh, to treat, and that's for, for herbicide. We have to be careful with, with herbicides, though, is that the native wildflowers and tree regeneration can be killed. One thing some of the, the companies uh, told us about, and we've tried and been successful, is you wait for about two more weeks, and then you go up there, and you spray, uh, you know, barberry or buckthorn or honeysuckle. They're still green, right? Everybody else, the leaves are yellow. So you can actually spray, and you're just going to be killing your target invasive species, and you won't be impacting the native stuff. And just one general thing, if you ever use herbicide, what I'd recommend is buy a bottle of dye. We'll sell it any place where they do it. And put some in your mix. You can see exactly where you spray. Um, I tell you, that way you know you don't spray a place twice. That way you know which place you miss. It's just like if you're cutting down a tree and treating the stump. Just add a little dye in there, and it just marks where you went. It's so much easier to see. And it actually, you can sort of feel that you did something. If you're ever out there just spraying, you look behind you, you don't see any effect. And it's kind of neat to see all the leaves as blue, green, and back. <laughs> Uh, one hint, though, is wash your clothes in a separate load of laundry. <laughs> Oops. So let's imagine we have 35% barberry cover. And you've got 40 hours of labor. Do you want to treat one acres, two acres, or ten acres? Think about it. And this is actually going to be a little bit of an ethical conundrum. And everyone has to think about this. How it relates to where they're at. Okay, this is probably a silly combination. Using propane torches followed by propane torches. But let's say you go out there and you cut it down with a brush saw. And then you use propane with a backpack once. You can do about two acres in 40 hours. And I think my seasonals are probably fairly equivalent to, you know, volunteer labor. If you cut it and use herbicide, you can do about 4.2 acres. If you get out there and let God sort them all and use a backpack mist blower, you can do about 10 acres. So like I said, it's, it's, there's a real trade-off by how much herbicide you want to use out there and how much you can treat. And that's something everyone has to look at their unique situation and make a decision. So just a, a couple of... A, Quick messages here, this alien invasive species can be controlled, and if you control deer density, remember I showed we're, we're hunting, and if you control alien invasives, that can reduce your exposure to Lyme disease, it reduces tick numbers. So they had those spots where they dropped the deer herd down to less than 10 deer per square mile, saw the decrease in Lyme disease cases. And where we controlled in basis, we went from those 126 dancing ticks out there mm -hmm. down to four. 40, really. There goes the Lyme disease. <laughs> so, I think I'm closing with this one. So, what are deer and alien invasive species? Well, originally thought, or what are alien invasive species a problem? Originally, we thought it's just when you had deer 
and when he had a disturbance to the force. That's what we've seen a lot of this. But we found this a little complicated. <laughs> <laughs> that was a cute movie. <laughs> because of things like multiple rows and bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle actually do better when there's zero deer. So again, the, the idea isn't to eliminate deer, it's just to control. Oops, that's right, I wanted to add this one in. So I was talking earlier with some folks, and I want to say this is some. I don't think there's much of here in Vermont. I think you guys have just have some small pockets of Japanese stillgrass. This is this is where you should be very afraid. This looks it looks kind of pretty, right? I've seen an entire watershed, one water company property. This is what it looks like. This is an invasive species. And I know some people are very reluctant to get out there and treat. And Jerry, I don't know if you've treated this yet. No, we haven't. I would think your setup would work beautiful. Backpacks, we didn't have enough heat. Yeah. Ideally, you'd probably want to get out there in mid-July before it gets really thick and matted. This is one, I tell you, you've got to have somebody treat that when you see it at the beginning of your property. If you don't treat it, it'll slowly spread for about five, seven years, and then it'll explode out in your woods. Once it's on your woods, it's got a three to seven year seed bank. You'd be fighting it forever. So there might be some reluctance for some people to spend money and either use herbicide or use flamethrowers. Or if it's really small, you could hand weed it all. And I, I tell you, that's really expensive. What's the, what's the name? What is it? <laughs> Japanese stillgrass. <laughs> what's it? Like close up. Huh? What is it? Close up. Close up. Close up. Uh, it looks like a grass with a silver mitten. Mid vein, but but look it up. There are yeah. What's, you, if you go to the Nature Conservancy, like Weedwise or any of those, you should be able to find close-up images. I don't know if they're on VT invasives yet, but yeah, you or, should be able to find. Like I said, it does, I can send you close-up pictures. I didn't want to look. I just want to say this is one. I think the thing is where it usually starts is right at a trailhead or right where ATVs or mountain bikes go in. That's, it's, it's usually moved on tires. Yeah. We have to watch for is on town roads. They were we were talking, or Gary talking, or somebody's talking earlier about, or it's not we being spread along roads by town equipment. This is really spread and can be spread by snow plows because it seems to come out and push it out. Could you spell that, please? Japanese. S T I L T. Stilts. Yeah, like stilts, you know, the, how they walk around on the six foot high stilts? Stilt grass. Yeah. So with that, I'll leave it there. And I have time for a couple questions. Yeah, and I also wanted to invite up to hear what's going on in, about deer biology management in our state. Kim Royer, if you could come up, who's the deputy commissioner. And also Adam Rukowski, who's a deer biologist, and Brian Ames, if you want to join us up here, who's head of the Fish and Wildlife Board. So if you have questions for Jeff's questions, or questions for Kim, or Adam, or Brian, they'll answer appropriately. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. You, you talked about uh, deer numbers and uh, lime rates uh, in Vermont. You know, what what are the areas where there's where are the areas where there's low deer populations? Uh, you know, high, you know, high deer populations. You know, and what's the mean? You know. Well, I'll start with a little his sure. history and then let Adam speak to the numbers. But this was an issue that we recognized. Uh, quite a number of years ago and started talking to consulting foresters and our county foresters. Um, they actually were the ones that brought it to us. They had those concerns. Um, and actually there's been a real effort in this part of the state to address the deer population because primarily of concerns over invasive species. And foresters came to our deer meetings to raise concerns about this. So. Um, I mean, Adam could talk about the kinds of things that we've implemented in the last 10 years or so. Um, but I will also say that one of the challenges for us is not just manipulating numbers, but getting access to properties mm -hmm. and, and having people open their properties up to hunting so that we can actually mm -hmm. control deer numbers on private lands. 
Um, and so that's one of the things that we actually started a database where we were trying to hook hunters up with landowners who wanted to invite hunters onto their property so that they could actually... Yeah, I'm, I'm aware of that. I was yeah. just curious about the numbers. Yeah, so he can, he can speak of, to the numbers. Deer, right, and I think what's critically important to understand is when we talk about deer and invasives, this is really a localized problem. So deer live in very small areas of home range, could be as right. small as, uh, you know, a 17-acre island uh, generally in the vicinity of one to 200 acres, and invasive plants are obviously growing in a single space. So uh, ultimately we need to address problems at, at the individual level, uh, and keep in mind that that means that uh, there can be places where there's a lot of deer and very mm -hmm. close by places where there are very few deer. Um, so ultimately, uh, you know, again, this is uh, recognizing that that scenario where there are too many, where deer are locally overabundant uh, uh, on a very small scale. With that said, uh, broadly speaking, as Kim mentioned, the uh, department has been aware that there are issues with the maintaining a working landscape and regenerating forests. And in southeast Vermont, the department has aggressively increased our antlerless harvest and reduce deer densities to levels that uh, have shown mitigation in terms of, of negative impacts from deer browse on forest regeneration. Uh, however, Can you give numbers? Uh, yes, so uh, prior to us lowering density, deer densities were in excess of 15, um, perhaps uh, near 20 uh, in places. That is to say that there are pockets sure. uh, before and now that have still exceeded that by far. Um, broadly speaking, uh, we have reduced those deer numbers in southeast Vermont, what would be WMU's Q, O, M, uh, and P, um, below 10 deer per square mile. Some of those units have returned above 10 uh, this year, um, but by design the department has lowered those deer numbers and held them down uh, with the support of the hunting uh, community, uh, with the understanding that that's good and ecological health. However, uh, we have not uh, addressed uh, the invasive species problem. We have not addressed uh, the ability of people to maintain a working landscape in a manner uh, for which they expect to do so. Uh, and that means that we need to continue working uh, with private landowners uh, and deer hunters uh, to not only maintain and properly manage the state's deer herd, but begin to address these invasive species. And I can tell you uh, that the department has a number of efforts uh, ongoing right now that are meant to do just that. Uh, to work with private landowners and work with hunters uh, on improving our education about invasive species to not just landowners but to deer hunters. I think most of them are unaware this is a problem. Uh, so we're working on making them aware that this is an issue, how it's negatively impacting the quantity and quality uh, of deer range, uh, and talking to them about how they can be proactive in addressing these things. And I think that's a golden opportunity for both deer hunters and landowners. Uh, to form a new partnership because it's ultimately about balance uh, and addressing the root of the problem, uh, you know, pun intended. So uh, it, it's very important uh, and something the department is certainly very aware of and, and acting proactively uh, to address. So, yeah, thank you. Well, one quick thing before. We've been, I've been about 11 years developing the equipment. Um, I hate to tell you how much time and money and tractors I've been through, <laughs> and, and nobody tell my wife. <laughs> but I, we've gotten it now, so it really is functioning very well. And the idea is to try to provide a, a, a viable alternative to use of herbicides, because my concern is that there's just so many invasives out there, we're going to be dumping way too many herbicides. I'm, we're not going to eliminate herbicides, but at least, you know, we can really reduce the use. So uh, what we do, Nor, this is the 4 million BTU flamethrower, there's, you know, and I, I wouldn't have any trouble recruiting 8th grade boys to run this. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Jeff. <laughs> they, uh, each one is 2 million BTUs, and this, I'll just, I'll just start with this, right on. So, uh, what happens is, watch your face. So, we use this primarily where we can't get with our machine, like over banks, rough, really rough places, or with re, re sprouts. So, uh, 
This is very effective on um, multiflora rose, fireberry, honeysuckle. We're just experimenting now with knotweed. Knotweed's a tough one. I don't know. Do you want to take a chance? Oh, we want to light it. Do you want to take a chance? You, you can, uh, I can get the crowd to stand back. <laughs> oh, there we go. They're very flavored. But uh, so what we do is if we're working out, you know, like we did, we've done a lot for Hanover Water Department. In fact, John was the superintendent of the Hanover Water Department. He liked what I was doing so much, he quit the Hanover Water Department, came to work for me. But once he saw the flamethrower, how could he resist? You know, they, uh, so what we did at the Hanover Water Department, we went through with the shredder, we shredded, you know, buckthorn was just so thick, you know, you couldn't see this far in front of it. Shredded it down, and then of course it re-sprouted. And then we came along with this, and we hit the sprouts, and we did it twice. And it seemed to set them back enough so that the you know there were some little red pine seedlings, maple seedlings, started to get ahead of the buck. I think it should have been done again, but they decided to put solar panels in the area instead. So, but so I, the main thing is you're not going to cure cure invasives just by flaming and shredding. You've got to have something else growing back to take their place. And so with this, we can be selective, and I'll show you how selective we can be. So, gas on? Yeah, the gas is on. Okay, let's see if I get any up on this end. Yep, I hear gas. Yeah. There we go. So what we do with this is if you've got a, you know, tree sprout or a honeysuckle or something like that, just like that. You just, and if, if you've got, okay, to say that light is, no. <laughs> but uh, if you've got like a moly flora rose, just a big, big thing, you know, like that, something you know, like that. That's about all it takes to kill the leaves. It doesn't kill the plant, but it'll kill the leaves. Then uh, what we found is it'll die back the next year, it'll sprout in the middle, and then you come flame like that and if you hit both of them from both sides you get it just fries that those re-sprouts and it catches all that dead canopy on fire and you get you'll know, probably you get 10 times the amount of heat that you would not like just because the whole thing catches fire but it doesn't spread out because it's still green and wet around now obviously we don't do this when it's really dry but we find of course rainy days is great but we also find when it's um, uh, do on the grass, you usually go until oh, 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning before you have to shut down. So you start at 5 in the morning and, and then you just take that off, just pull three pins, take that off, go to shredding the rest of the day. So, uh, oh, <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, right. Whoa! I got, I'm at the end of my rope here. So you turn her off time before I get in trouble. So, I always begin to realize you were getting there. They, uh, <laughs> they, uh, I don't know, it's just, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to hear what my wife said when I told her I was going to build a 4 million BTU flamethrower, but anyway. <laughs> so, uh, well that's for re-sprouts and, you know, the steep hillside, where you, where you won't, I mean, we can go very steep with that, but if we've got, you know, too many obstacles and we just, we can drive it up, flame out, and then move it along. So then we pull three pins on that, and then you've got a clearing rake on the front. So this rake has got teeth that go forward, teeth that go backwards. And so we uproot, we just got done in Durham, New Hampshire on a fairly good sized job, where we uprooted everything. And then uh, went over it with the shredder and shredded it up after it was uprooted ran over the spots where it's uprooted to make flat, you know, nice smooth plant, planting spots. And they're gonna plant in species that are good for cottontail rabbits. And then the teeth that go backwards, we can reach into old wire fences, say that are along a, along a tree line, pull out the old fences so that we can, because a lot of times there's a lot of invasives right, growing right through the fence. And we pull those right out. They might have fence posts and some invasives still tangled in the fence. Get, just keep reaching in, pulling that out, pulling it out to where it's already been shredded. Get on one end and just push that wire right up into a big ball. 
let it dry for a little while, come back and hit it with the flamethrower and it just burns out all the brush and all the old fence posts. Then you got a ball of wire that you can pack together and get rid of. And otherwise it's just forever take getting those old fences out. Then also with the teeth that go backwards, we can reach in. We got an invasive here, an invasive there. We can reach in between a couple trees or whatever, hook it and pull it out. And I've got little removable teeth on the outside corners facing backwards that we can reach in right next to a tree and hook out an invasive and uproot it. And you'll be amazed. I mean, if you've ever tried to uproot stuff by hand and you see this, you'll, you'll never, wow, it's just so much easier. And then also we can, the teeth, teeth going frontwards, when you're raking backwards, act as like a guide shoe. So when you drop the rake down, it glides over the surface and you just rake off the debris into a pile and then go over it again with a shredder and without digging into the ground. Then uh, if we wanted to move logs and things like that, and often we do if we've got big, bigger things you need to get rid of, we've got a set of tongs that just snap into the front and a video camera in the front so we can see where the tongs are and just drop them right onto the logs. Then uh, the cage, that's essential because otherwise you know, I, it wouldn't be so much fun to run this. <laughs> you know, but we can, on old fields, a lot of times the edges grow back in and they keep, you know, people don't mow close to the edges. And, but we can get right into the edges and let the brush just, we can dive right into the brush and get right up, take the edges of the fields right back, get them back to where they originally were. And if we go, oops, I keep talking in the wrong direction here. But if we go to the back and, I, I tried many, many kinds of, I'm, I tried building my own shredding systems and that was a mistake. I spent years and a lot of money. Finally, I bought this and it's just working great. It's got carbide teeth on it. A set of teeth costs a little over $3,000, but it looks like we're gonna get at least a couple hundred hours out of a set of teeth. And um, that, you just back, you can back into it and it just sucks suck stuff right in. In fact, you know, we get a tree like that, oftentimes it'll just suck it right into the, right in and you, know, you can go through, and actually mow grass. I couldn't believe it. They said, oh, it'll mow grass. And I said, what? You know, that will mow grass? Well, it does you know, a fairly decent job. I mean, there'll be occasional sprig sticking up, but that job we did in Durham, we had probably 30% of the, more than 30% of the area was weeds and, and we mowed it and then we did the, shredding and then we can shred I mean I've shredded logs like this it's not efficient to shred logs like that but you can and um, then the come along is for when we get stuck <laughs> so, so we often are tempted to go places where we really should know better and uh, especially this spring it was quite wet in Hanover Water Department I don't know why they call it water department but it was really wet <laughs> yeah. and we got mired so we got Inside here, we got nylon strap. We can put around a tree and some chains, and we can click, 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 and work our, work our way out. Um, this will tilt. It's got a hydraulic cylinder there, so you can tilt it so it engages the ground. You can actually till the ground, or you can tip it up so it just misses the ground. And these chains, these um, chains are attached. To, these are springs I made, put inside well casing. And so when I tilt it forward, and let it all the way down, it's riding on these springs and off at the ground about that, about that much. So the tractor being a fairly small tractor for this doesn't have to drag a dead weight. It's floating on the ground all the way to this, it's on the rear wheel, so I'm getting traction. And so all my horsepower can go into work and then it allows it to skim over the ground and not tear anything up. But then if we want to till, we curl it and can till. But this is made to go on a, this rotor design is made to run on tractors, um, machinery up to 600 horsepower, and we've got 60 horsepower here. And they never run anything on a, this on a, anything any smaller than 80 horsepower, and they were amazed by putting that floating system on, I, I can do equivalent about what a 100 horse tractor can do. Hmm. So, and a, the reason I went, stayed this small, is I want to be able to get, be able to transport it economically, so I can transport behind this pickup, three quarter ton pickup, Want it small enough so you can get in around homes. You know, I can drive right over somebody's lawn and not make any mess. And that's one reason I'm using these kind of chains because they don't dig up the lawns. You have to protect the tire and give me traction. And um, let's see, 
The other reason was is, you know, just say, well, maybe I don't have another reason. Maybe that was it, all the reasons <laughs> I had. But oh yes. The other reason was that this is the largest Kubota tractor I could get that still had hydrostatic. Right. And the hydrostatic's really important to be able to ease slowly in and out of because you're always moving back and forth and changing speeds and mm -hmm. so uh, but I wouldn't want to go any bigger anyway because then it would be too big for a lot of the mm. applications. And then we can do things that, you know, a lot of shredders are on excavators, and but they have a hard time getting in between the trees. Or you can go in around in between the trees, and of course you can't drive them across somebody's lawn. Skid steers, they use quite a few of these on skid steers, but then they don't have the uprooting capability. They've got the shredder, but they don't have the, don't have the rake on the front. And uh, also they're hydraulically driven, so it takes more power to run a hydraulic one where this one's PTO. And the hydraulics can overheat, and skid steers don't have the clearance. <laughs> the advantage of the skid steer is it's on the front. A lot of times I'm going backwards with this, you know, but it doesn't bother me to look too backwards. You, know, you can go frontwards or backwards. You're generally backwards over through big stuff and then go frontwards through smaller stuff. So, um, any questions? Or? Thank you.